Awesome. We are talking about the struggle's real. So as we go into this year, we are going to be real about things as our text says there in Romans 7. I've just taken out verse 15 in the Amplified to kind of give us a basis of what we're talking about. It says, for I am... For I do not understand my own actions. This is the Amplified Version. The voice translation puts that little piece this way. Listen, I can't explain my actions. I am baffled and bewildered by them. That's the Amplified piece. I do not practice what I want to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate and yielding to my human nature, my worldliness, my sinful capacity. So in other words, what, what's Paul saying? Look at, I know what to do, but I'm struggling to do it. I don't know why I'm doing the things that I don't want to do. Why, why is this going on in my life? Why am I struggling? Why am I wrestling with this? And if we're honest, we do the same thing. You know, there's things that I don't want to do that I have to fight against doing. And the whole premise of this is understanding we need personal deliverance because as I've shared before, we come to God with junk. And we've been told the lie that when we come to God, all of a sudden it all disappears. That ain't true, because you know it in your own life, it didn't all disappear. We still got stuff. So to the degree that we want to handle that stuff is to the degree we're going to struggle. And I mean it this way, you know the fight is always the fiercest just before it ends, Right? That's when you know it's coming to a close. It is raging. So you want to take solace in that and say, hey, I'm, I'm about to break through right here. So we understand there's going to be a battle. So we got to get our heads out of the sand, realize that this struggle is real, be honest with ourselves about it if we're going to really break through and get to the other side of freedom because God wants us free. A lot of people are running around saying they're free. They're not free at all. They're still in bondage. Look at how many people over this just this past year are in, were in fear and how they reacted just because of fear. And fear superseded the logic. Fear actually superseded a lot of the science and things, especially now. You know, a year and, and so much into this deal, we've got so much more science and so much more stuff and understanding about what we're on now, I am still shocked and amazed that people are still in fear of a virus that has 98% survival rate for nearly everybody. Why are you in fear of something like that? Are you in fear of getting the cold? You know, why, why do we fear these things? Because again, that's just showing, okay, we got stuff. It's not a good or a bad, let's just be honest. We all got stuff. And the point of this is we want to get rid of that stuff so we can actually walk out what the Word of God says. If Christ has set you free, you're free indeed. So I want to be free. I thought it was interesting. I put up a new thing yesterday on my Facebook profile picture, and uh, I don't think people fully understood why I put it up. It, it didn't have a natural meaning to it to me. It had a spiritual meaning. Live free or die. Because unless you get to that place that you're going to die without that freedom, you ain't going to fight for the freedom. Because a lot of us have learned to tolerate our stuff. A lot of us have learned to manage it and live with it. Many people have even taken it as their own identity, their stuff, and have no desire to get free from it. And unless you, you get to that place like Paul used that word hate, that strong word hate, unless you really hate the thing, you're never going to do anything about it. And a lot of us have learned to tolerate and live with it. So again, the struggle is real, and this is the underlying premise that we need to get set free, we need to be delivered from that. So our goals, there's three goals we have, and I just kind of shot them quick at you a couple weeks ago, so I want to just kind of stop because this is all new, this is all evolving, this is all fresh revelation, if I could put it that way, and to use Christian lingo. Um, 
it's not like a message I got all out and everything. Each week as I sit down and read over it and meditate over it, God gives me new stuff. And basically, we start at the front because many times I've shared with you before, I'm kind of more of a bullet point person and I assume many times you know what I'm talking about and God has to keep reminding me, everybody's at different places of understanding and revelation, so you need to walk through it slower and give more understanding to it. Does that make sense? So that's why we're just going to hit the goals again. And the first goal was to walk in complete freedom, complete and total freedom. And again, notes are on the website. Go there. And uh, everything's right there. So what do we want to do? We want to come to a place in our walk of faith where I no longer struggle with anything. Because I know people struggle with this issue of healing. People have struggled with issue of giving, not just financially, but of their time, their talent, their treasure. You know, a lot of people just decide on Sunday morning if they're going to church or not. They struggle with that time. Well, okay, if that's where you're at, that's where you're at. But don't you want to be free from that? You know, are we giving financially? Well, it depends on how the month's going and what's kind of left over. Well, don't you want to be free from that? Don't you just want to be able to do it and enjoy doing it without any kind of other encumberments with it? Not even having to think about it, just doing it. Our prayer, like I shared with you, my struggle with prayer. Why am I going to pray if God already knows what I need? Why am I asking him for what I need? Because I was ignorant about what prayer was about. I didn't, I had the problem. I didn't understand. You know, and others struggle with worship. Why are we worshiping? We're just singing songs. No, we're not. Don't you want to be freed from that? I was there too. Now I look forward to the Friday nights. Once a month. Just to sit and zone out and like go away. You know, it's awesome. Because I was under the misunderstanding. I had the issue. I had wrong belief about what worship was all about. It wasn't about singing songs until the message started. Now I understand. But I had to get freed from that. Or just like any other baggage from our past. See, John 8, 34 to 36 in the Passion Translation says this. Jesus is saying, I speak eternal truth, Jesus said. When you sin, you are not free. When you sin, you're not free. Because again, that's what Paul was saying. You know, the thing I don't want to do, I do. And the thing I do want to do, I don't. There's no freedom there. There's obviously, at the minimum, there's a struggle going on. It says, you've become a slave in bondage to your sin. So this is what Jesus is saying. Look, and I'm speaking in an in eternal truth. I'm speaking from a spiritual perspective, a heavenly perspective, a kingdom perspective. When you sin, you're not free. You've become a slave in bondage to your sin. Verse 35 says this, And slaves have no permanent standing in a family like a son does. For a son is a part of the family forever. In verse 36, I already quoted it earlier. So if the son sets you free from sin, then become a true son and be unquestionably free. See, many people aren't unquestionably free. They still struggle. And see, many people have bought the lies, well, we're always going to struggle. Why? Where, where, where do we get this stuff? You know, where, is, where does it say we're always going to struggle with stuff? We struggle with stuff because we're not free. That's what the struggle is indicating. There's a battle going on. And it's usually between a lie that you've believed and the truth that will set you free is where the battle really lies. So we want to come to that place where we're going to be totally free in every area of our life. Like I said, people... People struggle every Sunday whether they come to church. People struggle every time they go by to put something in the offering plate or whatever. It's just to be free, totally, totally free, unquestionably free, as that text said. So we've got a strategy in doing this, three points. The first one is this, to expose the lies 
that are keeping us from attaining complete freedom. So there's lies that are holding us in bondage. Do you understand that's the only power the devil has over you is a lie? That's it. It's just a lie. He didn't have any power other than a lie. If he can get you to believe a lie, now he has influence and power in your life. And now if you continue to um, participate in that lie and in that behavior, then demonic influences can partner with that behavior. And then it gets even worse. Now it gets into serious bondage. So again, it all starts with a lie, just like in the garden. Did God really tell you? Did God really say? He's always going to question God's word to get you to see, do you have a personal revelation of the truth, or are you just parroting and mimicking something you've been told? Because if that's what you're doing, you're really susceptible to get in bondage. So again, we want to expose those lies. John 8, 43. The 45 in the voice translation says this. You do not understand what I'm saying, do you? Why not? This is when Jesus was arguing with the Pharisees. He says, you don't understand what I'm saying. As you see, I put that in capital letters. Do you? Why not? Now catch this next phrase. God gave me a revelation on this phrase. This was awesome. He says, it is because you, don't, you can't stand to hear my voice. You can't stand to hear my voice. Why? When Jesus spoke, it was the very word of God. And they couldn't stand to hear his voice. And know it's interesting? When we speak to people, and you have the spirit of God in you, and you're speaking the word of God, same thing happens, does it? You can't stand to hear my voice. Why do you think they want to shut us all up? And censor us. And put that stupid thing over our face. Because they can't stand to hear the voice of a righteous person. They can't stand it. And that's what these guys were doing. See, there's nothing by accident and there's nothing by coincidence. They can't stand the word of God. That's why, how many times have you heard? I've heard it numerous times. You can't be preaching around here. Why not? Oh, no, we don't stand for that. Separation of church and state, da-da-da. No, no, no. And, and I really, a lot of times, didn't understand or took things personal. Now I understand why. They couldn't stand my voice. It wasn't my voice. It was the voice of the Spirit of God coming out and speaking. Seen that in church over the 30 years I've been doing this. How many people got angry and stomped out because all I was doing was reading what it said? That's why I had to remind people, especially when I was in James, I didn't write it. I'm just reading it. I didn't write any of this. I'm just reading it to you. So again, you are, then Jesus goes on, verse 44, you are just like your true father, the devil. And you spend your time pursuing the things your father loves. He started out as a killer, and he can't tolerate truth. The devil can't tolerate truth. So now you've got to understand there's God's seed and Satan has a seed. It tells us back that in Genesis 3. The devil has kids. And they can't tolerate the truth. So now we can better identify the devil's kids, can't we? Because when you share the truth and they get all uppity about it, Why? Because they can't tolerate truth. You know Jack Nicholson's statement, you can't handle the truth? Yeah. Now we get a scriptural basis. Now we're understanding. See, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, sharing with them the word of God, and they're all getting crazy on them. Just like people do today. You share the word of God with them. And why? Because they're of their father, the devil. Now again, it's not a condemnation. It's not a judgment. It's not anything. It's an observation saying, okay, now I know where you're really at. You are of your father, the devil. And it says, because he is void of anything true. There's no truth in him. 
That's why they can't understand the truth. There's no truth in them. So you let the ignorant be ignorant. You give them the truth. You don't fight with them over the truth. It says, at the core of his character, he is a liar. Everything he speaks originates in these lies because he is the father of lies. So when I speak truth, you don't believe me. That ought to help you out a lot now, especially in this time. Especially one year removed from a lot of stuff that now that was, we were told was a lie last year is now coming out as truth this year. Why? Because they couldn't tolerate the truth a year ago. But see, the truth will always come out. The truth will always come to light. But it only comes to light if people continue to share the truth. Don't shut up about it. The truth is the truth. And share the truth of the Word of God. So I want to remind you, we've been programmed from birth with lies. So we were all born in trespasses and sins, and that makes us spiritually dead. When we came into this world, we were spiritually dead because of trespasses and sins, because of Adam. It's a spiritual generational thing. That's why we take the blood to break those spiritual generational things. So because the truth is only discerned spiritually, we don't know the truth. That's why people fight with you about the truth. Because if you're born again and you share the truth and they're not, the truth is only discerned by the Spirit. Because He's the one that guides you in all truth. You getting the connection here? So that's why they fight. That's why they argue. That's why they don't see it because 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world has blinded their eyes. So again, I'm just sharing this so once we understand this, or at least for people like me who need to that understanding piece, now I know how to better approach things with people, understand they're not just being argumentative. They're just not arguing and fighting. Probably what's really going on is the demon's getting stirred up in them, and that's what you're really dealing with. But besides that, they're spiritually dead and can't discern the truth. How many times could you read the Word of God to somebody and say, yeah, I know what that says, but I don't believe it? How can you not believe it? It says it right there. Well, did you read the newspaper article on that? Oh, yeah, I believe that. Well, you believe those words, but you didn't believe the one in this book. How does that happen? Because, again, truth is only spiritually discerned. Now, the Spirit of God will open us up to that truth so we can become born again. But there was another understanding of that. The truth, because the Holy Spirit's going to guide us into truth. He's the one that reveals the truth to us. So again, we want to expose those lies that are keeping us from attaining that freedom. But we also want to understand our need for personal deliverance. Now again, I keep on hitting on this piece because I was taught the opposite of what I'm sharing with you now. And I didn't understand the struggle. I thought the struggle meant, okay, I was the bad person. I've got something wrong with me. No, there was nothing wrong with me. I just didn't understand that when they told me all things became new when I became born again, they didn't know what they were talking about. What became born again, like I've shared with you, is your spirit man now becomes alive. So now I can communicate with God and understand the truth. That's what happened. Now from there, the Bible says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What am I going to work out if I'm already all cleansed and whole and well? There's nothing to do. Because we weren't that way. Things of my past dogged me. Different things came up. I had a fight, struggle, just like he talked about. So, I, so we need to understand there's a need for personal deliverance. 1 John 3, 4 through 9 in the Passion Translation says this, anyone who indulges in sin, and because of the Passion Translation kind of, um, you know, clarifies that and expands on it a little bit. It says, who habitually sins, 
Okay, and, and he's going to clarify this a little bit. Hopefully it's going to bring you some understanding. It did me when I read it from here. It says, lives in moral anarchy. For the definition of sin is breaking God's law. And you know without a doubt that Jesus was revealed to eradicate sin. And there is no sin in him. So Jesus came, the Bible says, and it's going to say it in this text, to destroy the work of the devil, which was sin. His power is in sin. Jesus came to eradicate sin, and there's no sin in him. So when I become in Christ, he's in me. As it says in John 17, you get this jumbled thing. The Father's in him. He's in the Father. Father's in us. Jesus in us. We're all kind of wound up together. There is no sin there. So that's why he tells us to abide in him, because there's no sin in him goes on to say, anyone who continues to live in union with him will not sin. Because this text always bothered me. It's like, okay, so if they're sinning, they must not be born again. And I'd always make judgments on people, and that's not a good thing to do. So it says, those that are in him will not sin. So to me, it was pretty black and white, cut and dry. Okay, you're born again, you don't sin. You're not born again, you do sin, but guess what? I'm born again, I know I'm born again, and I still struggle. So something's got to be up here. I'm not kind of getting the full picture. So it starts in verse 6 and says, But the one who continues sinning... Now here's a, a, a bracketed piece that brings some clarity again. The present tense of the Greek word throughout this section indicates a, a behavior that is persistent and habitual. John is not speaking about those who are yet to walk in complete victory, but those who continue sinning and find ways to excuse and justify it. That's the key. We call it today that greasy grace stuff. You know, well, God loves me and he's good with it and he knows and, and all that stuff. The verse continues, says, hasn't seen him with discernment and know him by intimate experience. That's key. They don't know him through discernment because our God is a consuming fire. He's not too keen on sin, right? Nor do they have a deep, intimate relationship with him. Now just think about that in the natural. I have a deep, intimate relationship with this woman right over here. Why would I want to do things that I know she would not like? Why would I habitually sin and make excuses for it? Oh yeah, babe, I'm going out Friday night and I got this other woman on the side and you just got to kind of deal with that and that's the way it is. But God loves me, you know, and you love me and we're going to make all these excuses and justify it all. That's what people do with God. Why? Because they don't really have an intimate relationship with them. The person you have an intimate relationship with and deeply love, you will not purposefully do things that you know they hate and they don't like and would do harm to them. We know that in the natural, but a lot of people actually use the love of God as an excuse and justification to do what they do in the spiritual. Verse 7 goes on, it says, the light, <clears throat> delightfully loved Children, don't let anyone divert, don't let anyone divert you from this truth. So John's saying, look it, don't let anyone divert you from this truth. Don't let anyone mess with your head on this. He says, the person who keeps doing what is right proves that he is righteous before God, even as the Messiah is righteous. But the one who indulges in a sinful life is of the devil is operating under the influence of the devil that is belonging to the devil, not to Christ, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. It says the reason the Son of God was revealed was to undo and destroy the works of the devil. And that's why he left us here to do the same thing he did, to destroy the works of the devil which was to dispel lies. See, we've turned this thing into a behavioral issue only. People deal with emotional issues, all kinds of issues. He wants to destroy all those works of the devil. It says everyone who is truly God's child will refuse to keep sinning. 
Never serve sin because God's seed. Catch the rest of this verse. This, this is awesome. That's why I put it in this translation. Everyone who is truly God's child will refuse to keep sinning. Never serve sin because God's seed, this is the Greek word for sperma, male seed, remains in him. And he is unable to continue sinning because he has been fathered by God himself. Wow. That puts a whole new spin on being born again. I never looked at being born again as fathered by God. I figured I was just this scumbum that needed some cleaning up. And see, I think that's the way a lot of us look at uh, our born again experience as we're just cleaned up sinners. No, we were fathered. That's why we are a new creation. That's what the Greek words are saying here. His seed is in us. It says, we have been fathered by God. Now listen to the explanation. Or born of God. We have been fathered by God himself and we carry his DNA, his genes. That's what it's really talking about. So we, follow, we have his DNA in us. So no, I don't give a flip what the doctor has to say. Or what's your family history? I don't have one. It goes back to him. He's my father. Now in the natural, I get it. But no, my mindset's going to be, I have God's DNA. I have his genes. I don't have Jim and Lita Gazowski's genes. I have his genes. And see, as I believe that, and I partake in that, and I partake in his blood, things can change inside of me and inside of you. But again, it starts with, are we going to believe the lies that you're always going to be like this, you're always going to have this problem, or I am going to believe, you know what? I have been fathered by God himself. His DNA and his blood runs through me. I have his genes. And people are going to say, you're yeah, crazy. It's okay. I'm cool with it. I'm good. Leave me in my happy place. I'm all set. Because God let me know. Let the ignorant be ignorant. If they don't have that revelation, that's okay. I got it. I ain't letting go of that because that's a good one. I got his genes. I got his DNA running through me. Because I was fathered by him. That's a whole lot different than just being cleaned up by him. Because that's what I told being born again was. You're just a cleaned up sinner. Because in the faith I used to be in, we always had that cute little mantra, right? That supposedly sounded so spiritual. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Well, if you're just a sinner, then you ain't saved. Because you can't be a sinner and saved at the same time. You're either saved or you're a sinner. Because who the sun set free is free indeed. See, because that makes you think what it did for me. I'm just cleaned up scum. No. I was fathered by God. You know why? Ooh, thank you, Lord. This is good. Because God said he was going to make man how? In his image. What's God? Spirit. God fathered every spirit because he is father. And every spirit proceeded from him. And we are a spirit being walking out a temporary human existence in this flesh here on this earth until we die because the spirit never dies. It either goes that way or that way. Because the spirit never dies. And that's what we originally were created. We only got put in this thing to relate to this realm. But the real you is spirit. Fathered by God. But the problem was when we came here, we were born in trespasses and in sin. So our spirit man was dead. It was still fathered by God. That's why the Holy Spirit comes to regenerate it. Make it alive again. So your spirit, soul, and body. But the main thing is your spirit. Fathered by God, got his genes.
That's why we can walk in wholeness and health and completeness and all that stuff. But that's where the struggle is because this may all sound new to you right now and you're like, ah, I don't get all that. That's why you need that deep intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit and allow Him to guide you in all truth. So we need to understand that need for personal deliverance. Get a revelation. You've been fathered by God. But not only that, learn that there are various ways and means of personal deliverance because it's not a one-size-fits-all. See John 16, 13 through 15, this in the voice translation says this, the spirit of truth will come and guide you in all truth. He's going to guide you. I'm not going to teach you truth. He's going to guide you into the truth that I'm sharing with you. It says, he will not speak on his own words, speak his own words to you. He will speak what he hears, revealing to you the things to come and bring glory to me. The Spirit has unlimited access to me, to all that I possess and know, just as everything the Father has is mine. This is the reason I am confident he will care for my own and reveal the path to you. So again, that's why I keep shifting my mindset to, okay, I have all things. I have the Spirit of God. You guide me in all truth. Now in the natural, I gather information because I'm still a natural being, right? So we're going to gather information. Now I'm going to take that information and bring it to the Spirit of God and allow Him to guide me into the truth of that. So as I've shared before, if there's a stinking pile sitting there and it stinks, I don't care what somebody's going to tell me it is, the Spirit of God's going to reveal the truth. It's a stinking pile, and everybody thinks it's just a bouquet of roses. Knock yourself out. Be ignorant. It's okay, but I ain't going there. Because He is in me to guide me in all truth. He's in you to guide you in all truth. So let me give you a takeaway. Personal deliverance is just that. It is personal. There's not a one-size-fits-all. And I know it sounds like I'm beating a dead horse, but in this natural realm, they keep trying to push us into a one-size-fits-all scenario, don't they? And that's pretty evident over what we've gone through over this past year with what I call the beer virus. You know what I mean. Because there's certain people want to censor certain words, and we don't need this pulled down. One size fits all. Put this on, stick that there. One size fits all for everybody. The world will try to fit you into a one size fits all. I got, please, please, if you get nothing else today, get this. You are a unique being designed by God and he knows what's best for you. And you must get into him, seek him, dig into him, and allow him to guide you into all truth. And your truth is going to look different than the other guy's truth. Because you are on your own path and your own destiny to walk out. And it's not the same path somebody else is on. Even Christianity is trying to conform everybody to look the same, act the same, talk the same, and walk the same. Religion is in the same game. No, God, come on. Religion has a deep state, guys. Do me a favor, jot this down. I heard this this morning, I looked it up. Look up the Yale document. You can watch this, go to the end, look up the Yale document. Do you know there are well-known Christian preachers and ministers, and if I said their name, you would be shocked, who believe and have signed a document saying that the Christian God and the Muslim God are the same God? That's like heresy. And see, that's what I mean. Evil is so blatant and bold and in your face. Now they got a document out there for all to see. The devil has infiltrated the church. That's why in the end, 
many are going to be deceived and many are going to walk away from the truth. People that we think are so great, it's scary. There's not a one-size-fits-all. We're not even a one-size-fits-all. People come in and they're like, no, we don't want that. That's cool. Because we're here for a purpose. To change and grow and impact this city and this region. That's why I call this an ecclesia. That's why when we do home churches, they're going to be oikos. It's totally different purpose and meaning behind it. Because we see two of those in Scripture. This is more for warriors. This is more for those that we're in. We're going to take on the enemy. We're going to stand and fight. We're going to stand for the truths of the Word of God. Yes, we're going to stand on healing. We're going to stand on deliverance. We're going to stand on what the Word of God has to say no matter what case closed. We ain't against. We're for. I'm for the whole book. Every jot and tittle. I'm for the whole thing. Oh, okay. I'll just read this and then kind of I went off on my little thing. I'll give you meditation scripture. Uh, that was just eating me up because I saw that this morning. I couldn't believe it. I never heard of it, and uh, I'm watching this thing on YouTube, and I'm like, wow. I was like, wow. Because that's how the enemy works. If the enemy keeps you deceived, and you don't know he has you, and that's why they want to silence the truth, and that's why censorship has been so nutty. It's not by accident. It's not to stop disinformation. It's to stop the truth. All right, I'm just going to rant a minute. <laughs> Save the scripture for the end. <sighs> if it was disinformation a year ago, why is it now truth a year later? Because it was truth a year ago, but they didn't want you knowing it was a truth a year ago because it was agenda we had to funnel everybody into. And once we got everybody funneled into it, now we can control you and manipulate you, but now the truth will always come out. Always. That's why the Bible says the sin will find you out. You can't hide a lie. The lie will eventually come out. But the whole idea was, if we keep saying it was true, 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 if you tell a lie long enough, people are going to believe it. Oh, that's what they think. Now, some will, but people are starting to wake up. Especially about the beer virus is coming out, right? I guess it actually did start where they said it started. But all us folk were just stupid and didn't know what we were talking about back then. With a lot of other things, it's coming out. Now, again, it's not a good or a bad, but for me... What I'm doing with it personally is I'm looking at it and saying, oh, you know what, God? I really got to press into you because, Holy Spirit, you need to guide me into all truth. Because I make decisions based on the information I get. And you know what? I've been lied to so much about so many things, and I've made bad decisions because I took that as truth. No more. I can't go there anymore. You have to guide me in all truth. Your word is true. So when I gather all this information, okay, Holy Spirit, this is personal, me and you. What do I need to gather out of this thing? Like I shared with you last week, Robin and I watched the exact same preacher, and we got two different things out of it. Why? It's personal. The Spirit of God wants to speak to you personally. But you have to have that mindset because it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's okay, God, how do I walk this thing out? How do I deal with this situation? And if you look completely different and crazy to everybody else, you've got to be okay with that because you know you're being guided by the Spirit. You've got to understand you answer to no human being on this earth. You're a sovereign being. He's the king. 
He's the one we answer to. But we get told, no, we answered everybody else. I, I thought it was funny. I've told her, you know, because we just had the king downtown extend his deal for another 15 days or whatever the heck he did. And I was sitting there thinking, you know what? I have not done one thing he has supposedly mandated me to do. I'm still here. I'm still alive. Now, if other people wanted to do that, that's fine. But that was my choice. Because I did my own research and my own stuff on it. That's all I'm trying to encourage you to do. Once you get comfortable with who you are, who God made you to be, your mission and purpose upon this earth, do not be diverted from it. As John just told us, don't get diverted from this truth. You are a sovereign individual and God never created man to rule over man. That was man's deal. We did that a year ago when we talked about government. All right, rant's over. Let me give you scripture. Take home, hold on to. This is why I give you so many scriptures. I want you to know I'm not just giving you my opinion. I'm giving you the word of God and sharing with you how I see it. You may see it differently, but that's okay. As long as you are getting your information from the Spirit of God, I'm just trying to encourage you, point you, direct you, sometimes kick you, whatever encourage you unto love and good works, as the scripture says, is why we gather together. But as long as you take it and you sit down with it and say, okay, God, I didn't get hardly anything that guy said Sunday. Will you speak to me? You know what? He will. You sit down and open the book for yourself, take the notes out, whatever. But here's our meditation scripture. <laughs> In John 14, 15 through 17 in the Passion Translation, he says, loving me empowers you to obey my commands. Love for Christ has proven and demonstrated to be demonstrated by our obedience to all he, that he says. If you're loving him, that's what's going to motivate you and drive you to obey him. I love her. That's why I've changed behavior. I've changed things. Some things, my first wife didn't care. They bother her. So guess what I did? Changed. Why? Because I love her. It's not like, well, the other one didn't care. What do you care then? What's your problem? No. We do that with God. It's like, well, God, you said this and this and this. No. When you love somebody... Like he says, it empowers you to obey the command. It gives you that empowerment. It gives you that courage. It gives you that stuff. Ha, I'm hearing somebody say, you must be afraid of her. Seriously. <laughs> Come on. I can clearly outrun her, no problem. So I ain't afraid at all. And she doesn't know how to shoot the gun. She doesn't like it, so <laughs> not afraid at all. Verse 16 and 17, we'll wrap it up. It says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another Savior. And I thought that was interesting when I read this text. And I'm going to, he, the text is going to explain it later. He's going to give you another Savior. So this is when Jesus was talking about, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to the Father and I'm going to send another comforter, a lot of scriptures say. But this one says, a, another Savior, the Holy Spirit of truth, who will be to you a friend just like me. So Jesus let him give him a heads up. Hey, I'm going, but I'm going to send another one in my place. A savior. And he says, and he will never leave you. You're never alone. Ever. He's never going to leave you. You're truly born again. Spirit of God lives in you. You've been regenerated. You're never going to be alone. He's never going to leave you. It says the world won't receive him because they can't see him or know him. But you know him intimately. That's a huge key. We have to know the Spirit of God intimately. Not weird, flaky like some Pentecostals are. That's why I praise God for my Baptist roots. He got me grounded before he got me into the flaky. 
I can balance it out. I probably need to get a little more flaky. Some people think I'm crazy enough, but I mean, every, at least everything I do, I take to the Word of God and say, okay, did that happen before? Yeah. Paul said he ascended into the third heaven. So when I say, yeah, I felt like I went there and I saw things, people are going to say, you're crazy. Well, wait a minute. Paul did it. I have precedent. I have something I can go back to and say, no, that's not weird. Guess what? Ezekiel got lifted up by his hair. Now, that ain't happened yet. I don't want that deal, but I just go on my own. I don't need to rip the hair out on the way up. So it's happened. Or seeing things, discerning things. So again, because it's rooted in Scripture, that's cool. But now the point in that is know him intimately because many times we'll see things, hear things, and we won't know, is that to share with somebody? Is that for me? You know, am I supposed to just go out in my backyard and declare it? Am I supposed to get one of these and blow it every day? What do you want me to do, God? That's why you got to know him intimately. That's why you take everything to him. He says, because he remains with you and lives inside of you. Now, let me read this explanation here. This is going to help. It says, the Greek word, alios, means another of the same kind. Okay, that's why he said, I'm going to give you, I'm going to send another Savior. This is kind of explaining that. Another of the same kind as Jesus is the Savior from the guilt of sin, the Holy Spirit is the Savior who saves us from sin. That's why we have the Holy Spirit to save us, to set us free from the bondages of sin. You don't do it on your own willpower in your own strength. And that's why so many people fail and struggle. Well, I know I ought not to do this, just like Paul said, but I end up doing it anyway. What the heck's wrong with me? How come this person just didn't have the same struggle I do? Because it's not a personal thing you do on your own. You do it with the Holy Spirit because you develop that intimate relationship with him. Because Jesus says, I'm sending another savior to you. Some of you need to get saved from your emotional bondages, physical bondages, lies, deceptions, whatever. It says to save us from the power of sin by living through us in fullness. That's why last week we talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need the fullness of the Spirit. Then it goes on to explain verses 16 and 17. It says, the Greek word here is parakletos, a technical word that could be translated defense attorney. It means one called to stand next to you as a helper. Various translations have rendered this counselor, comforter, advocate, encourager, intercessor or helper. However, none of these words alone are adequate and fall short in explaining the full meaning. This translation has chosen to use the word Savior for it depicts the role of the Holy Spirit to protect, defend, and save us from ourself and our enemies and keep us whole and healed. That's huge. He's here to protect us against ourself because we've been programmed in the natural. I have to protect myself. I have to meet my own needs. I have to do all this. No, he's here to save us from that so that we understand we need to rely on him in all this and he's going to guide us into all truth. Goes on to say he's the one who guides and defends and comforts and consoles. Keep in mind that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ our Savior. The Aramaic word for, I can't say it, which is taken from two root words, I can't say it, means to end, finish, or to save. The other part of the word means the curse. What a beautiful picture the Holy Spirit uh, comes to, the, to end the work of the curse of sin in our lives and to save us from its every effect. Paraclete means a redeemer who ends the curse. He ends the curse. He completely breaks it. Jesus died on the tree to set us free from the curse. The Holy Spirit now works within us to redeem us from it, to break it. 
So many times we try to do things on our own. Well, I know I need to get healthier, or I need to do this, or I need to, to change the way I think about this, and we struggle and struggle and struggle in our own power and our own effort, and you'll only go as far as your own willpower can endure. And then you finally give up, something happens, and you finally break down again, and you go back to it, and now you're back with Paul. And you know, the, this thing I hate, man, I'm back into it, what's going on? The whole problem is the wrong approach. And you just don't lay it at Jesus' feet. Okay? How many of us have gone and laid it at his feet, and three months later we're back doing it? Because it's not a behavior that's the issue. It's the stinking thinking that's the issue. And it might not just be stinking thinking. It also could be a spiritual thing going on. And some of that we're going to go through as we talk about deliverance and understanding it's personal. And it's not a one-size-fits-all. Because some people do need counseling. Some people do need, you know, casting out a devil. Some people do need, you know, whatever. As we go through all the different means, some people just need to engage with God and let him just take it away. But we've made a lot of this is, is us doing the effort. There always is two sides of the coin, right? But all too often in this type of stuff, we focus on ourselves too much and what do I have to do? Know what he's saying? What you have to do is develop an intimate, deep relationship with the Spirit of God. That's where you need to go. And then from there, let him guide you into the other issues. You know, a lot of the stuff that I finally broke off over the years, I was going after the wrong thing. It was over there in that field. It was in left field. I was in right field. Because I never asked. I just read a book. I got this issue. I read a book. What do I got to do? I repeated these prayers. I did this stuff. And nothing ever changed. Now, what the information I got was good. But it wasn't to meet my need. Because I'm in right field and the issue is in left field over there laughing. But then when I got in left field, it wasn't laughing no more. It had to take a hike. You know, some things you got to take into the court of heaven and deal with. I mean, there's just different approaches. So please, I want to leave this with you as an encouragement. Don't give up. Don't say, I guess I'm never going to get free from this. Don't say, I guess this is the way I'm going to be. No, who the sun sets free is free indeed. He wants you completely and totally free of everything. But it's got to begin with, do you want that? And I'll tell you now, it's going to be easier than you think. The reason why it's been hard and you struggled so much is, yeah, you've been in the wrong field and taking the wrong approach. I'm not saying what you were doing wasn't good stuff, but you never asked the Spirit of God, is this the way I deal with this situation? And let Him guide you in all truth. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you that your word is sweet in our ears, Father. In your kids' ears, your word is sweet. And I thank you for that. And Lord, I know if your word goes forth and it grates us in a certain area, it's probably because we're buttoned up against that lie. So Father, may we not consider that a negative thing, but a positive thing. Something that you want to do in our life and you want to clean up and straighten out, not because we're bad, but because you want to make us free. Because again, Lord, why would we want anything less than what Jesus paid for? Jesus paid for complete wholeness, wellness, sozo, nothing missing, nothing broken. No lack, no need. That's what salvation is. But Lord, many times we lack in our bodies, we lack in our hearts, in our souls, in our minds. And we walk around like Paul saying, I don't get it, Lord. The things I don't want to do, I do. And the things I do, do, I don't. And, you know, how am I going to get set free from this? And Paul gave us the answer. He says, thank God for my Lord Jesus Christ. Because, Father, none of us would be here without you sending your son to die on the cross in our place. And us receiving him as our Lord. And confessing him with our mouth. 
And Father, from there, you said, okay, now the work begins, kids. Time to get cleaned up. So, Lord, help us in this venture as we walk it out to be an encouragement to one another, support system for one another, because we're all going to go through different things at different levels and different ways. But, Father, we're here for one another because we're all in the same boat, just in different places, getting rid of different stuff. And, Lord, I thank you that who the Son sets free is free indeed. So, Father, we praise you and honor you and worship you. May your spirit continue to move in our hearts and in our minds. Give us divine revelation. So when we walk out of here, we walk out differently than we came in this morning. And we honor and you praise you for it now in the name of Yeshua. Amen and amen. Amen. And again, mind you.